Welcome to Change Enablers, a podcast by Tango. Sit back, relax, and listen to some of the brightest minds in operations and enablement. Get actionable tactics from our handpicked guests to help you lead successful software rollouts and drive company transformation. And yes, we cover all the ways to win over your most reluctant adopters. Let's kick it to Ken, your host, to preview today's episode. Hey everyone, just got done recording an episode with Pomi Tefera. Pomi was one of my colleagues at Uber, uh, a common theme on the podcast, but uh, Pomi's now running operations at CoFertility, uh, an incredible company with an amazing mission uh, to, to create fertility solutions that are more accessible, more personalized, more human. She's behind all the operations that make that work. And so we talked about a whole gamut of things from you know, how do you accommodate personalization at scale? How do you provide real-time enablement solutions? There's a lot in here for everyone. So sit back and listen. Hey everyone, welcome to the Change Enablers podcast. I am super pumped to have Pomi Tefera here. Pomi was one of my colleagues at Uber, has had an amazing career that I've been able to follow. Actually started her career at General Electric and their rotational program. Like I said, I met her at Uber. She was working on product ops at the time. Moved on to another mobility startup called Token Transit and has since gone from mobility to fertility, which I love. I actually stole that from Pomi. Her passion is bringing sort of tech and virtual experiences into the physical world. And we're going to talk more about that today. So Pomi, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ken. Happy to be here. And for you know our regular listeners, they all know that we start with a few just quick sort of icebreaker rapid fire questions. So I'm going to jump into that now. You've, you've spent your whole career in ops in some fashion. And, you know, we knew ops very well at, at Uber. Can you start by telling us what you think is the most underrated ops function of the many that you have to mm, take? The most underrated. So I would... I would summarize it as execution because you can have the sexiest strategy, but at the end of the day, it's about getting it done and you all, we'll, you're you always going to win on execution. And I would say ops, early on in your career, you are doing the work that's like behind the scenes that when you're doing it right, and this is same with finance, right? Where I originally started my career, when you're doing it right, it's in, it's invisible because it's working. and at Co-Fertility, we affectionately call it keyboard catting, like that, that gift. And it's the work that you do in the background that makes you the expert on how things actually work. How are people actually navigating their needs step by step? And that's what allows you to really own and influence decision making because you are an expert on the process, the tools, the people. So uh, yeah, I guess execution, keyboard catting, as we affectionately call it at Co-Fertility. Yeah, I hear you on that. It's it's the blood, sweat, and tears of, of any business. And I remember like at Uber, it was often also this like bed for innovation and, and how we productize different things because we would do something that was so clunky. Mm-hmm. It's like we can't possibly be doing it this way any longer. Like let's turn this into a product. So maybe maybe the the takeaway is that ops in and of itself is underrated. You know, you're behind <laughs> your keyboard catting but it's so critical. Yeah. Speaking of things that are critical, what are your three favorite software tools right now? Ooh, okay. So my three faves. So obviously Tango, love Tango. Documentation is super important at our company when you we interact with so many people that get involved in someone's fertility journey. And our, our member advocate's role is to be the big sister and the project manager. Take things off of their plate so that they can focus on their fertility journey and and taking an active role on their fertility team and being able to document processes so our our member advocates can spend more time asking why rather than what needs to happen is why I love Tango and hand in hand with Tango's Loom, always recording Looms, whether it's explaining something that's happening in our forecast model or you know, a member advocates explaining to each other how to do certain steps like that, that async and easy to document, whether it's video or SOPs, a super cool. And then recently, for my third tool, we recently adopted a tool called Copper, which is like a CRM that in, integrates with your inbox. And a lot of 
our journeys, right, that we have with our members are managed over emails. A lot of communication with clinics and stuff um, happens over email. So being able to track all of the interactions, whether it's emails and, and actually codify the stages of our journey through that tool um, with that native integration with um, Google Suite um, has been really cool. That's, that's super, super awesome. And, and I would imagine like for your member advocates, having that context is key. Just, just remembering, you know, where did we leave that conversation off? And, you know, I think that's, what's powerful about Tango and Loom too. We're in this like sort of special age where you have no excuse for not giving someone the context that they need to do their job effectively. We use Loom a ton internally as well. So I want to shift a little bit and talk about, you know, your career, you went from general electric to Uber, big name brands, to startups, Token Transit, and now you know a, a smaller startup in co-fertility. Operations is probably the common theme for three of those four. What would you say are the biggest challenges in those transitions and the biggest differences in ops across the, the roles and companies that you've had? Mm, yeah, that I think the biggest thing for me and is something that always bubbled up in my feed, the feedback I received when I went into the startup stage, which is done is better than perfect. I'm like, I'm a framework girl. I love, I have a framework for everything. I love reading like medium blogs from like different people in the space. And I love building the a dope model and, and just like kind of losing myself in like building something, but which is great when you're kind of like the analyst on this specific team at this specific vertical of a, of a business. But coming back to this theme of like execution, when you're at a startup, there's a world of opportunity and your job is prioritization at every single minute of a day. And you have to like, you're put in the position of, all right, you have a great idea. What would have to be true for this to scale? And doing just the minimum to validate that is like, I have to force myself, pull myself back to, to like, just ask myself that question. And someone at Uber, Jeb, who was on the tech strategy team, oh, yeah. he like, like radically shifted something inside me at Uber that helped me with this, this transition to startup life, which when we were like pitching to like the tech, tech leadership or, you know, ops leadership, for running company planning, which is a really dynamic kind of prioritization exercise with a lot of people, is ahead of these big conversations with a lot of people, he would challenge me to add, like lead with, what is the, what is the decision that needs to be made in this conversation? And what is the information that you anticipate the leaders needing to feel confidently make that decision? And asking that to myself up front before I prepared that, you know, that big deck and letting that guide how I, you know, even structure the information, that conversation really shifted to something inside me of how to approach decision-making. And he would go a step further and, and try to guess what is the decision that they're going to make. And I think like, I mean, that I saw that made him such a capable and like a, a capable leader leader who had strong intuition because he's learning from all these different people by anticipating what they would do and then learning from what they actually ended up doing. So I definitely pulled from that that, that question from Jeb, even made pages like, you know, as the agenda for the deck, like, what are the decisions we're trying to make here to guide those conversations? I, I pulled that like to almost all the conversations I have in the startup land as well. Well, and, and I feel like every conversation is that when you're in a startup, it's like, yeah. we have to make a decision. And I love, I mean, Jeb is probably one of the most effective people that, that I worked with at, at Uber too. And, you know, I love that framing because it also gives you kind of like a success criteria. Mm -hmm. for the exactly. I mean, so many of us go into meetings and we're like, well, I think it was good. Like we had a, we had a decent conversation, but like knowing the outcome and knowing the decision you have to make is is really, really powerful. And I think there's, there's a beauty in like almost the simplicity of that. And so my next question for you is like across all these roles and experiences you've had, what do you find is like the top thing that ops teams overcomplicate where they lose sight of, you know, the beauty of simplicity? I would say it's like reporting debt. 
So you have you have like one problem at month zero of of launching, and you you know come up with a bunch of data around your funnel and observe and things that you've decided to quantify, and that hunger for data you start reporting it, and then you know you're in month three, five, you're year four, and you're still reporting that information. And then it becomes this like your eyes glaze over every time you're in a weekly meeting talking about these this, these data points. And in an effort to, to be really informed, you're actually losing focus. So I would, you know, kind of challenge, especially companies that are and teams that are growing really quickly to be like, well, do we actually need this right now? Do we need to continue having supporting this process and looking at this specific data, or do we benefit from zeroing in on the thing that's at hand right now. I, and it overcomplicates things because it's like you're spending X amount of time every week running this report, looking at this data, and it's like, what, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this again? Maybe I would say that. Yeah, and not to mention, you, you already hinted at prioritization. Mm -hmm. when you're looking at so many metrics, it's hard to, it's hard to understand what the priority is, you know, because it's like, well, all right, we've got to manage towards all of these. There's so much more power in saying, here are our top three priorities. Here are the three metrics we're going to move. We're not going to care about anything else until it's become a priority. Mm -hmm. Whereas like you look at this dashboard and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to make mm -hmm. everything green. That's, that's pretty hard. Yeah. So, and I would say this is something that big companies, um, it's easy to like mess up because prioritization, you can't prioritize unless you're actively saying no to something. Um, so just because you say these are our top three things, that's not that's not it. That's not prioritization. Prioritization actively saying we're taking this off the list so that we can all focus on this thing. And I think with big companies, there's this like desire to like do all the things and like, you know, empire build in some ways. And you 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 don't get a hard no on uh, focus at for a period of time in the way that startups because we're resource constrained have to do. So that's that was one thing that was refreshing for me to have to practice coming from a big company to a startup. Yeah, startups are so greenfield. There's there's opportunities everywhere. Mm -hmm. you know, we try to remind the team as well, like every new thing we say we're going to do, there is a cost, and we have to figure out like what the trade off is going to be. So I totally hear you there. You know, I, I didn't give you a chance to to talk a little bit more about co fertility because it's really interesting what what you're doing and. I'd love for you to tell the audience, you know, what is co-fertility and, you know, as a startup, what's the big thing that you're trying to solve or differentiate on? Yeah. So co-fertility, we are reshaping fertility preservation and third party reproduction. So it's more accessible and human and community driven. So on the one hand, we are helping people freeze their eggs. They can do it through our keep program where we're supporting them. They're going through their own egg freezing journey and giving them community and discounts, or they can also do our split program where you can freeze your eggs for free. If you donate half of them to a family who can't otherwise conceive. And then on the you know other side, we're helping intended parents find their, you know, their don't their donor match. And, you know, some of the key things here are we're taking cash compensation out of it. And there's a lot of I'll help. Let me start right here. There's a lot of stigma on egg donation, and that's largely rooted in cash compensation model. So there's like a Harvard study of donor conceived people showing that like 62% of donor conceived adults think the exchange of money for their for you know their eggs is wrong, and their 40% of them were disturbed by the fact that money was exchanged for their own conception. So that stigma discourages people from helping a family grow when that might be something they might want to explore, right? We work with a lot of people who are like, wow, hurting, like helping the LGBTQ community or family who's been trying to conceive for a decade, conceive would be like a, a really amazing gift. And then being able to preserve my own fertility while doing that is like perfect. It's like mutually beneficial. And so we're helping them do that and we're humanizing the journey along the way. Like we take a strong stance that Anonymous donation is a thing of the past. It's something that donor conceived people really advocate for parents being open about their origins, if it's important for identity formation. Also in this era of like being able, anyone with a credit card being able to order a 23andMe test and like social media, it's yeah. 
really makes me side eyed that like anonymous donation is even like referenced or used in the space anymore. So we help people kind of navigate what's the world pragmatically outside of that, right? So we have disclosed and undisclosed donations instead. That's amazing. What like such an incredible mission that, that you're all on. And, you know, when we talked about co-fertility, just in, in prepping for the episode, you know, one thing that struck me is, is how personalized it is and how, you know, the member advocates that are on your team develop these relationships with people that come to you for, you know, for these fertility solutions. And, you know, I have to ask you, is there a, is there almost a natural tension of being a startup and, and trying to scale, but also preserving this ability to meet the unique needs of your members, of your customers? How do you balance those? Yeah, that's super important. We ha this is a deeply personal journey, fertility and trying to conceive. And like on the intended parent side, for example, the needs of a hopeful dad, you know, gay dad say he, you know, he knows from the beginning, like I'm going to need some, like something to get involved here, either adoption or an egg donor, right? He has a di very different need from a couple that's experienced infertility for a decade, right? And they've been in and out of so many clinics, right? So you can't, you can't support them on a journey if you're doing like a cookie cutter approach at all. And meanwhile, standardization, we, we have to deliver on that personalization without compromising on the key benefits of standardization, right? Efficiency, quality assurance, fairness. So we, we, and of course, ultimately offering a streamlined experience. So how we navigate that tension, it's, it's pretty dynamic, right? So one is we just have a treasure trove of educational content. And we, you know, whether it's learn articles that we're churning out, our chairwoman writes so many learn articles that, you know, teaching people, informing them, like, so that they can make informed decisions on their own journeys. And so I, identifying the specific things that people need contextualized in their journey at one time. That C, a CRM and using a CRM and defining key milestones that are dependencies, right? There is a linear process in egg freezing and egg donation, right? you apply, you provide personal and family medical history, clinical team approves it, you then do the actual medical screening and you can only do legal until once you've done medical screening. So there is a structured linear process in that sense and we've defined that journey internally to mirror it. And then how we interact, this is the education that we provide, the compassion and the guidance, right, that we, that we provide, that's where personalization really comes in. Yeah, totally. And, and I feel like those member advocates, you know, they have to sort of like preserve some of their capacity to be able to do that, to be able to connect mm -hmm. emotionally, to tailor the experience. So can you talk a little bit about your enablement efforts such that you're equipping those member advocates with the necessary amount of standardization and preserving some of that dynamic time to, to be able to build those relationships. What are you doing sort of tactically to enable them? Mm, yeah, so tactically, so data, so one of our company values is data is queen. And so data is the heart of the decision-making process. So you, you do that to, to track and analyze behavior and movement and uh, through the journey, right? We use a tool called Metabase, which I fell in love with at my previous startup, that it allows anyone, you don't have to know SQL, you know this, at Uber, all the ops teams basically became data scientists because you're in SQL writing these like mega queries, but I'm hiring people who are like case managers and work as social workers or have worked in clinics. And I don't want to, there to be a SQL learning hurdle to enable them to ask questions of our data. So Metabase is kind of like Mad Libs, TurboTax version of, of SQL, where it's like join, it's like naturally at, you know, having you join tables yeah. to ask questions. And ultimately the questions that we're asking are, what is blocking our highest intent members from moving forward? Because that friction, of course, blocks low intent. And low intent isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just yeah. means that, you know, intent is defined as, I'm ready to do this thing and I care a lot about doing it. 
So that that's where education comes in so that they can they feel like, you know, they're ready to to take the next step in their journey. So understanding what's blocking high intent people from from moving forward in their in their in their journeys and, you know, being able to analyze the data and saying things like what what is this success group doing that the the other this other group is not and kind of vice versa to understand kind of patterns in a very human journey. It's a lot of quantitative, like I mentioned, but of course there's always, we have to pair it with the human why. So, you know, looking at that data, segmenting people and using MetaBase to, to put it in the hands of my team, but then encouraging them to tell the human story when we're talking to our team and make somebody come off paper. No one is a number at in our in, internally, right? We are telling the human story all the time. Yeah, that's... That's I, I love how you bring that sort of together, that quantitative and qualitative piece, because, you know, a lot of times one is going to help explain the other. Mm. When you're bringing on member advocates, you know, to make sure that they have the knowledge that they need at their fingertips, you know, what, what, what practices have you sort of instilled with the team? How do you make sure that that sort of knowledge and documentation is accessible to everybody? How are you doing that? So when we're onboarding them, this is where like, documentation is so important and and we can't let things go stale and so the the whatever they're reading no one has time to go completely redo all of the things so our sops have to be living breathing documents that people are continually going back to to check so one is like there there has to be a living breathing documentation at all times of our of our processes for existing and new employees and so we, we actually, all the things that are like, this is the biblical grade truth live in Notion. So like the looms and the tango at SOP dots and things like that, that we're recording, we put them in kind of Notion as our company like command center, our, our cultural values, all, all of the things that are like, this is not going to change and always come back here, start in Notion. So when they come, they get this mega doc that they are, that tracks everything and it's framed as a checklist and it's organized as be a sponge, be a contributor, and then become a leader. And it doesn't matter who they are in the company, become a leader. What I always tell them is leadership is a choice, not a title, right? So especially at a company at our size, like being a leader is means that you are you own the prop, you fall in love with the problem. You are like optimistic and, and accountable for the problem. So it's organized in that way. And we're they're coming back in, in, into this document and like checking as they go the, the resources that they've read through. And then for my team, I set up an every other morning for, for the first two weeks check in where I ask, like, have them ask me questions about, you know, what they've learned. And I specifically always tell them, look, the become a contributor phase is like you have fresh eyes, like challenge. Yeah tell us this doesn't make sense anymore i would approach it this way like this is just as much an opportunity for for our team to improve things with your fresh eyes than it is as it is for you to just like soak everything up yeah and and i feel like that's where you start building that culture of we're continually revisiting what we're doing which is so critical i actually think we did that exceptionally at uber mm. where it was like yeah we had a lot of outdated documents but we were always like revisiting the process and trying to improve it. How else are you sort of building that culture within your teams at CoFertility to say, hey, you know what, we might have a view of the world today that's written down in Notion, but if we find a better way or if the world changes, we we respond to that. How do you do that? Mm, yeah, I think like as a manager, especially what's really important to me is there has to be safe a sense of like safety on the team where we are all in love with the problem whatever the problem is right and challenging something or you know i think one of so when we say data is queen as our one of our cultural values it means we are unafraid to be wrong in the face of new data in fact i love to think about what is the time that, you know, in the last period that I changed my mind because, you know, that I felt strongly about something, I changed my mind. And I, and I feel like in life, whether it's work or outside of work, it's so important to have 
the the realizations and shift and evolve because you're learning and so on the team it's important to feel that safety where it's like it's not about me it's not about the incredible effort that i'm putting in it's about the problem and we're all in love with it so I, yeah i think that safety and that trust is really important on the team and as a matter of culture and then also the like just this practice of understanding you know the insights the human insights and focusing on them so that we are all kind of oriented around that same thing. And with my member, the member advocates on my team, they are of course accountable to the end-to-end -end member experience, but that everyone at our company, right, is accountable to the member experience. Jesse from BD will have an idea because, you know, a question comes up with the clinic and she is like in there changing agreements, like it doesn't matter what your what is like your title or your role on paper we yeah. all have the same shared goal yeah uh, yeah I, I love that it's almost like removing ego from it removing prior decision making and and just saying hey this isn't about any one person in particular this is about the mm -hmm. problem we're solving i remember i had a manager who and you know it always caught me off guard when when she would say this but she would caveat a lot of things with Hey, I have no pride in this, but like, here's what I think. And I always thought it was kind of weird. She said it all the time, but you know, like you said, what she was doing was saying, Hey, this isn't about me. Like, this isn't about my view on it, but here's mm -hmm. like a thought, react to it. And yeah. I think that's so powerful on teams to, to have that psychologically safe space where you can question assumptions. You can raise your hand because so many teams don't have that and, and they lose because of it. I love, I love that you're doing that. You yeah. talked about member experience and everyone falling in love with that problem. How does your team sort of evaluate the impact that you're having on member experience? How are you sort of gathering, you know, you talked a lot about data is queen, but how are you sort of ingesting that feedback and saying, hey, we're making improvements, we're doing well, or we're not doing so well, and here are the areas of opportunity? Mm, yeah. So one of the OKRs or things that we always talk about on the team is magical matches. And there's different measures for a magical match. First and foremost is, of course, the clinical outcome, right? Ultimately, they're, they're working with us because they want to preserve their fertility, help another family conceive or, you know, conceive themselves or with the surrogate. And so we have to solve for that. Of course, we're not in control of it, but we can see, change the way we sequence the process and you know, surface information at the right time to optimize for clinical outcome. For example, we rolled out AMH testing. Everyone should get their AMH test to level, their anti-malarian hormone level. It's a measure of your ovarian reserve. So easy to get tested and tells you a lot about your fertility. So we rolled that out upfront for our split members when before they match um, so clinical outcomes the second is time in the process of egg freezing it takes time people think well sometimes people i've, I've got text from a girlfriend like hey i'm in town for a week can i go freeze my eggs it's like oh no honey we got we got stuff to do first so we have to set and manage and meet expectations around time in bd in partnership they say time kills all deals that applies to lots of things. And so it's important to really s to establish expectations on what it means to what, how long it will take to get from match to cycle and measure that and look at the footprint of time as they move through the process and see the differences in different matches and, 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 and glean insights from there. So clinical outcomes, time, of course, sentiment. Sentiment is more something we have a pulse on and, you know, at bigger companies, you're actually like measuring this through NPS scores and stuff like that. For now, I read every single email that is sent with member advocates and CC and so does our CEO. And we're, you know, doing that to have a pulse on things so that when things, in, you know, inevitably bubble up, you have some of that historical context because especially on a journey as emotional as this one, it's never just about that moment. It's about everything that's happened before it. Um, so sentiment. And then finally, the match, the match itself. Um, we, I love this part of it. It's so much fun to do that matchmaking, understanding like the fundamentals of I, like what people want out of their donation arrangement. 
I would love a disclosed donation or contact information is exchanged. Okay, but what gradient of dis like scope and uh, and frequency of communication are we act are the scenes that come to mind, and making sure that they're aligned on that fundamentals like that. But then there's also the human aspect of it too, right? Like, are they do 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 we think that they would enjoy having coffee together one day? Do you know this is a lifetime connection, either like practically if they're choosing to for it to be that way, or just like cosmically. So that matchmaking aspect of things and make and you know asking the right questions to make sure yes or no are they aligned is the you know the last kind of category of things that I'm I'm looking at for our matches. Yeah, that's a lot of things. That's a lot of yeah. things you have to balance too. And yeah. you know, you actually mentioned I saw it on LinkedIn. You know, you posted for a role, and one thing I love that you said was if you're interested in building an operations moat, and that to me is like all those things that you mentioned, relying on data, balancing sort of this tension, that this natural tension of like, we need to standardize, but we also need to personalize. Mm -hmm. when you say operations moat, you know, what, what do you mean exactly by that? I mean that in this space, like many others, it's not about the idea. It's not about the intellectual property, even at Uber, right? Lyft quickly came after, right? And then we were competing and that, I mean, that, that was great. The, and in my eyes, it's like a rising tide lifts all ships here, right? We want egg freezing and egg donation to be more accessible to everyone. For us though, you know, when we talk about building a moat, it's about execution and doing it right and, and having kind of that peripheral vision on the human why to, to be able to, that's backed by data to be able to deliver on the, the promise that we're making to our members. They're really trusting us with a really incredible journey. Yeah. And that, that trust, I feel like is so important between your members and your member advocates. And like yeah. we talked about sort of how you build that by making sure that everybody has the standardization to be kind of speaking the same language and delivering a similar experience, but then yeah. creating the capacity to have a, have a personalized human relationship with your members. And so I, I think what, what you all are doing is, is super, super powerful. Any other, you know, sort of unexpected learnings from your time specifically at Cofertility that, and I'll put this question almost back on you, that, that changed your mind about, mm. about ops. So, so something that took me by surprise and, you know, directly experiencing my own embryo freezing journey informed this as well is that this personalization, it, it really applies in the clinical setting as well. The specific meds that you get, the protocol that you put on, how long you're on those meds, the timeline, right, of, of your experience, it's all personalized. And, you know, there's of course guidelines out there and you're, and you're working with a reproductive endocrinologist who's an expert, but it is subjective, right? And they're, Look, they're looking at so many signals, your biomarkers, like your AMH level that I mentioned before, and so many other things and tailoring a protocol to you, a plan. And then you go in and you start your, you know, your shots and they're, they're doing these monitoring appointments every other day, almost every day to, to see how your body is responding to the medication, how your follicles are growing. Right. And, and then no, that night you get a call saying like, you know, tune your dosage or tune your meds this much. And so for me, you know, in a, not being a, a medical professional in the past, what I thought this was is like, okay, there's a clear framework, there's specific meds and you're kind of working through a checklist and it, no, it's super personalized. And so not knowing that and not having the understanding of things that your care team are looking for can is is the is the opposite of empowering so for example I'm, you're sitting in your your ultrasound transvaginal ultrasound so you have a wand inside you and they're you know doing something and you could easily just be twiddling your thumbs just kind of letting the time pass it's a really quick appointment and then you find out you know some information about the scheduling of your retrieval after but really to know that okay they're I'm, I'm seeing them, they're measuring my follicles, they're, they're measuring to an specific size, 
and when they reach that specific size of like you know say 18 millimeters that's when i can take my trigger shot and so realizing how deeply personalized and kind of dynamic the treatment is is and 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 understanding what are the key questions we can encourage members to ask their care team when because we can't be in that room with them right so ask so how how are my follicles tracking on average like what size are they that helps you anticipate oh we're not where we need to be at this thing is going to move right and now i got to go tell my team like my retrieval is moving right and the, the out of office block that i had like if you don't know that information or the framework for how they're approaching decision making on your on your body it just seems like the clinic is kind of slang and dates and like not thinking about your like life. So I think like where I've changed my mind is the, the learning that this is deeply personalized and you have to have a role on your own fertility team, your own care team in any, in any medical setting. You have to, you, it's a dialogue. You have to be make, like try asking questions and establishing kind of that open communication so you can take an active role. Yeah. And, and I think what you said that really struck me is we're so conditioned to try to think of everything as, okay, there's a formula, there's a formula for success. There's a formula for scale. There's, you know, inputs and outputs and, you know, it'll happen in some predictable way. But I think what you're doing with your team and helping your member advocates sort of embrace that dynamism, the flexibility that they need to have also helps kind of bring members along for that journey too. So Thank you for sharing that. The last question that I'll ask you, and this doesn't have to be your CEO per se that we're talking about here, but how do you, how would you make a CEO care about operational excellence? Something you obviously care a lot about, but you know, what's, what's sort of your pitch to say, Hey, this is why this matters. Ops answers the question, what has to be true for this to scale? And the CEO at any company has, hopefully, is the person who has the vision of what it what they want to do today, but hope, hopefully also what they're excited about doing to take this to the next level and to the moon and beyond, right? And ops is that that right hand that that helps them disambiguate the the things that have to be true for something to scale. And so ops needs like their oftentimes doing that tough stuff in the trenches, right? But that stuff in the trenches is what explains the human why. It's what answers the question of what does this cool, sexy idea that you have for the future need, need proven to, to scale and helps kind of measure that kind of the go to market, right? Whether it's internal or, or externally for things to, to get there. Yeah, and going from today to tomorrow, whenever that tomorrow is, and I don't mean literally tomorrow, you know, there are all these checkpoints along the way. Mm -hmm. What decisions have we made? What have we learned? How do we adapt based on what we've learned? You know, how do we ingest sort of the quantitative and qualitative feedback? And those are all things that are owned by like a thriving operations organization. So you're almost saying like ops is the reality check <laughs> in some ways. Not saying that they can't be optimistic too, but it is the reality check. Is that fair to say? It's it's it a hundred percent is the reality check, but that also goes hand in hand with the some sometimes the greatest ideas, the like the lowest hanging fruit to unlock something comes uh, because you're intimately aware of the details. So it's both a reality check and a window into um, the problems or opportunities. And this is something that I really appreciated about working in product ops specifically is you're not necessarily the decision maker in product or ops but you're at the intersection of the two and your role is influencing decisions and you know when you're when you're product ops or even just ops in general working with an engineer for example they own the elegant solutions right but you are equipped to ask to help tell the story of what is the problem or opportunity so that they can help craft the elegant solutions. And the same thing with working with marketing, right? Like my team gets to interact with our members every single day and the marketing team who owns the support and education that they receive from us, our brand voice, right? Before we get to talk to them in person needs to understand what are the problems or opportunities that our members have 
whether you're customer service in ops or, or like ops or product ops, you, you get to be in that position of crafting the story so that other people who are on your team, you know, marketing engineer can, can own those elegant solutions. Yeah, that's, that's great. We're all just trying to make the best decision given the information that we have, which yeah. is absolutely something I'm taking away from this conversation. So Pomi, thank you so much for, for joining us on the podcast. It was a, a great excuse for me to, to reconnect with you and, and learn a little bit more about what you're doing. So I'm sure the audience is going to love it. And thanks for, thanks for spending some time with us. Thanks, Ken. This was fun. It was great to catch up. Thanks for listening to this episode of Change Enablers, a podcast by Tango. If you like what you heard, share with a comment or leave us a review. And don't forget to subscribe for more episodes. See you next time.